In this special two-part edition of the Levity Zone, we get political. Roll back your clocks to November 2011 at the peak of the Occupy movement. Yours truly, Dr. Bruce, found himself back east in New Jersey, just a stone's throw from the Occupy Wall Street protesters at Zuccotti Park in New York City. You might recall that these brave souls dared to speak truth to power. Occupy represented deep dissatisfaction with a nation and a system deeply riddled with corruption that even the founding fathers of the Republic had feared and foretold. It seemed to me that a radical remake of that very system was one of the only ways to reboot the mutually self-destructing apps of politics, money, and influence. So I drew on ten years of thinking on the subject and penned a five-part document called By and For the 99%, a visionary blueprint for a radical remake of America or any other country. A draft of that document went live that month and drew enough attention that I found myself on conservative talk radio, specifically KSCO 1080 AM, on a show with host and radio station owner Michael Zwirling, or MZ as he is known. Join me and MZ in a spirited and challenging conversation about the Radical Remake, which at its core is the convening of a second constitutional convention in the United States. The podcast following this one will feature even more spirited interaction with callers responding every which way to the proposal. Good morning, now stay right here on KSCO Radio. When someone has breast cancer, if it's bad enough, they frequently go through a procedure called a radical mastectomy in which the diseased breast is removed and replaced. Our country is in a turmoil and people are running around protesting but rarely having any suggestions for fixing our monumentally complex problems. It's becoming increasingly clear to many that we need a radical remake of our political system in order to preserve the greatest country in the world. Google Bruce Damer, D-A-M-E-R, and you will discover a most unusual and brilliant person who was recently featured on the Dr. Future program here on your favorite radio station. A serious thinker, world traveler, engineer, problem solver, and all-around good, nice person, Dr. Damer will present his fascinating visionary blueprint for a radical remake of America. special music fanfare it is so unusual to have something positive on talk radio it's so unusual these days everything in the news is negative everything on talk radio is bitching and moaning and no solutions it's about time we had something positive uh, and some um, and some uh, solutions to the uh, problems uh, offered here. Now, one thing we can all agree on, ladies and gentlemen, and you can all agree with me on this, I'm sure, is that there is something dreadfully wrong with our uh, uh, government and our country and our political system and our world, and everything's all bleeped up. I mean, you can all agree with me on that, right? So it's with a great honor that I introduce Dr. Bruce Damer. Hey, Hey, Bruce, are you there? I'm here, MZ. Cool. You're there via Skype. You sound almost like you're here, right here in the studio with me. We've been on the station a number of times uh, with our mutual friends, Dr. and Mrs. Future, who I've got to say have been very good friends for many years, really, really special people, and they brought a, just a wonderful dimension of positivity to this radio station, including you. And, you know, I, I didn't get to hear the program as it went out, but when I heard about it, I said, God, I wonder if Bruce would consent to being on the Saturday special, and, and, and you did. So welcome aboard. It's great to be here. Hopefully it's not the Saturday night special. <laughs> Anyhow, uh, what, what we're doing here is we're, we're offering, you're offering a, a solution to the, to the problem. And did I, did I state the problem okay, or maybe you can state it a little more eloquently? Everything yeah. seems to be falling apart, I guess is 
What do you think? Yeah, it does. And this happens to countries. Uh, we've seen it happen to countries all over the world. We saw it happen to the Soviet Union. Uh, we saw it happen uh, certainly in Eastern Europe. We saw it happen over generations. We've we've seen it happen in the the dictatorships of the Middle East. And countries get themselves screwed up. They get themselves tied in a knot. And often there are many prescriptions to get this knot untied. And the United States, uh, I think it's clear to everyone on the left, the right, the center, every walk of life, uh, that uh, we have to undo a mess that's been created, a, a tangled mess, and we have to remake the system. Uh, there's no way to reform the system. We must redo it. Well, you know, I seize every opportunity I can to remind our audience that the reason that I'm in this business of, of talk radio here is because back in the late 80s, the, the planning department of the city and county of Santa Cruz had such a, a horrible reputation, which really hasn't changed much uh, in terms of being an impossible, frustrating, you know, high blood pressure inducing agency to deal with anytime you wanted to do anything with your property. Um, going to get a permit was like, you know, it was like an act of Congress almost. And it was because we, we started a group called Citizens for Planning Reform, CPR, and we did a talk show on this radio station, which was then a music station, except for that two hours once a week. Uh, it was on Monday nights where we did the Citizens for Planning Reform, or CPR, talk show. And it was mostly people, you know, complaining about the system and not too many suggestions about how to reform it even though that's what we called our, ourselves. You bring up a very interesting point right now. It's just don't even think about reforming it. Just, just dismantle it and restart again. Now, how, how, do you, how do you do that in such a way where there isn't, um, you know, total chaos? I mean, there's gotta, if you're going to dismantle something, that means you're, there's going to be some period of time where there's no government at all. <laughs> so well, how do you deal with that? Well, in our Radical Remake Blueprint document, uh, what we spell out, I ask the listeners to uh, kind of roll forward their clocks for a second and consider, and th this is a very California thing, vision the possibility, i.e., look at what if the ideal circumstance had, had come about in our country. However it happens, uh, we're not sure right now, but what if there was a, a constitutional convention about to, to open uh, all across the country and where all the groups, all of the stakeholders in, in the great nation are about to rebuild and re, remake the country. What if this actually occurred? And then you can kind of work backwards from there. If you put out a powerful vision, the universe just lines up the stones and the pebbles and allows you to walk toward it. As long as you're pure in that vision and you really you know, you really vision it and you really share it. It's amazing how these things come to pass. So I'm sure that you know, like Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak in 1976 when they founded Apple, they had a powerful vision. They wrote about it. I've got a lot of the documents in my DigiBarn. Those guys just visioned where they thought Apple could go in the best possible way. And by golly, they got there. And so the, the Radical Remake, its first goal is to say, we're going to describe a future America that's being remade, being reconstructed. Uh, a lot of things have happened. A lot of things are happening. And say, hey, everybody, wouldn't this be great? Or let's, let's shape this vision. And then I think you'll start to see the, uh, the pathway toward that. Now, who can argue with that? I sure can't, and I, I doubt that any one of our listeners can, can do that. Although we'll, we will give them an opportunity to do so when we open the phone lines. Uh, you know, later on in the uh, program. Uh, you mentioned Digibarn. You brought it up first. I was going to during the program. I have been to your Digibarn. Your Digibarn is, I think, uh, if not the, certainly a world ranking museum of computer technology development. And you've got, you've got every kind of a computer there from a Cray supercomputer down to an Altair and, you know, every, everything in history. And it's just the most amazing thing. And, and you decided to put this thing together a few years ago, huh? Yeah. And, you know, mainly it was the passion for trying to understand how 
relatively at the time, small group of people decided to make technology to remake the world, which did. I mean, we are here connected through the computer because of a handful of people who built stuff in the 60s and then a bigger handful in the 70s and a bigger handful in the 80s. So in some sense, that background gave me the belief and the evidence that with a small group initially and the use of technology and the use of positive thinking and the use of investment, you can change the entire world because Silicon Valley and, and its progeny have reinvented the world and they are now the tools by which we will it really reinvent is. politics and the economy. And it, it, it's absolutely true. And I keep being reminded about the statement that Steve Jobs made to uh, John Scully when he was trying to get him to come over to Apple from from Pepsi Corporation or PepsiCo. Do you want to spend the rest of your life making sugar water? Or do you want to change the world? And so, yeah, you're absolutely right. So, uh, all right, w- where are we right now in terms of changing the world? You you have authored two or three drafts of a document that you call the, the the Radical Remake of America document? Yeah, it was very inspired. We were here in New Jersey at the moment, and sort of surrounded by Occupy Wall Street events. And my wife, Galen, and I were just so inspired by this bottom-up push, this push that turned into a shove on Thursday with the New York City's finest uh, about Occupy Wall Street, and of course all across America and the world. And... I'm from Canada, so I've been a lifetime observer of America, as most Canadians are. We're sort of armchair observers uh, looking south. And I've always wondered, well, I'll I'll roll back my clock a bit. Yeah, please. That'd be great. Uh, So I immigrated in in 1985, but in the year 2000, I finally got, because the INS had lost my paperwork, I finally got to be sworn in as an American citizen, a very proud moment. And in the hall, there were a thousand of us in San Jose, and the federal judge came in. And he was an amazing guy. But he said, I love this job. I love this part of my job. It's so creative compared to what else I do in, in my job. And then he told us something that was a pretty big shocker. He said, in your hand, you've been given a voter registration card. Now, let me tell you, we do not have a democracy anymore at the national level. You as citizens uh, have no access, but we still have a functioning democracy at the local level. So please fill out your card and try to get involved. And it was like, this is what a federal judge is telling new citizens. Of course, after that, the 2000 election fiasco happened. That was the first time I voted in this country. And it was clear to me, not only we don't have a functioning democracy, we don't even seem to have a functioning uh, Supreme Court. We don't have uh, a functioning electoral system it was just all broken it was clear it was broken. And that was almost 12 years ago yeah yeah and so then in the last 12 years i've been thinking well has america really ever had a full democracy that you might find in the sort of democracy 2.0 countries the, the countries that got democracy in the 19th or 20th century and i kind of concluded it never has had a full democracy and What I mean by that is there's always been a major chunk of society that's been disenfranchised. In the beginning, it was women, people of color, people who didn't own land. Uh, And now, today, it's um, everyone is disenfranchised by special interest lobbying and money. So we've never had a taste of full representative democracy with multiple parties, with flexibility, with voice, with people that aren't rich Bruce, people. I, I, I'm dying to know your answer to the following question. What country has had such an exposure? Well, interestingly enough, me being a Canadian, I'm a little, I'm a little jaundiced about Canadian politics, but frankly, Canada almost broke up twice. Uh, we had a separatist movement in Quebec, and we've had many challenges to our confederation. And It was always through public votes that the people in Quebec basically said, no, we don't want to separate. The people really spoke. And we've got four or five federal parties. We've got no special interest money in politics. And it never really occurred to me that Canadian politics was something special. But then I I moved to the United States and I sort of thought, hmm, it's different here. 
I then moved to Czechoslovakia, which was converting from communism and reestablishing a democratic system. And I watched how that country did it. And they had 50 parties in the first poll. It was really a, a wonderful chaos as they reestablished public interest in, in their governance. And then I was in South Africa right after the fall of apartheid and the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, where they basically, people who had committed crimes in the previous regime came up and admitted their crimes for immunity. And that's how they karmically cleaned the society as it became a, a democratic society. So all over the world, there's different formulas, but uh, the representation that people are able to affect in many other countries is, is, is certainly much more much more convincing than it is here. Right. Oh, my gosh. We're talking with uh, Bruce Damer, who is a world traveler. Uh, how would you describe yourself in, in like a paragraph? I'm kind of an architect. I've architected software systems for a long time. I've architected scenarios for NASA to visit asteroids and designed architectures for origin of life research. And this latest blueprint is just kind of an architecture exercise. All right. Well, I'm I'm looking at the uh, draft uh, uh, completed November 14th, which was just a few days ago. Uh, I'm going to read just a couple sentences to it, and and I've already emailed Jonty, our our webmaster, and asked him to post this on ksco.com in a prominent spot where you click on it, and it'll take you to this document that you can read or download. By and for the 99%, a visionary blueprint for a radical remake of America or any country. This happens to be draft 3C. Where do the Occupy and other progressive movements go from here? The grievances and the villains have been clearly identified, the philosophy and the operational principles established, and there is a sense of optimism in the air that change is possible. I respectfully ask you to roll forward your clock to a day not too far in the future when by some set of amazing and unforeseen events the ideal outcome has arrived. Hold this thought for a moment. So what would this ideal world look like? Anything you can imagine, so let's put it all together. To get us started, I've pinned a modest blueprint for a radical remake below. Why do this kind of exercise, you might ask? Having a vision for the best possible outcome is essential as it gives you a point in space to aim at. And we have all experienced that when a shared, clear vision is held and actively pursued, the universe always seems to provide all of the steps to reach it. Now, I'm not going to read the whole document. If I did, it wouldn't take but maybe, I don't know, five or ten minutes or so. It's not a difficult read. Uh, if it was, I wouldn't be so fascinated by it because I'm one of the world's slowest readers and comprehenders. But it's, it's not a particularly long document. It's very understandable in plain English. And we're talking with the author of that document, Bruce Damer, who is our guest on the Saturday special today right here on your favorite radio station. Now, let's get into some specifics about what you recommend that we at least consider in your document. What really jumped out at me is the whole idea of lobbyists and special interest groups have sort of taken control of everything. I mean, any group that's powerful enough or rich enough to be able to afford lobbyists to wine and dine the lawmakers and influence them, chances are going to get their way to the detriment of more people than not. And that's probably the number one thing that's wrong with our system. Would you say, Bruce? Yeah, and uh, literally the first part of the blueprint envisions the day when the Constitutional Convention opens. And I know a lot of people from their high school history of America read about the amazing process by which the framers and the founding fathers put together the United States. The intelligence and the leadership and the debate that went on, it was absolutely breathtaking how that was done. So can you imagine a 21st century constitutional convention? What will happen at that convention, because it will both be online and in physical locations everywhere so people can show up, the first vote, and it would be a direct citizen vote through the net and through polling stations connected to the net, would be to basically outlaw the practices of lobbying right on the spot by direct citizen vote. And that would cut the umbilical cord between moneyed interest and the body politic. That would be number one. And by the way, prior to the convention opening, this may be weeks prior or months prior, all sitting politicians down to a certain level will have resigned their posts 
and left the government. See, it's it's a different world. It's not the same situation now than than when the country began. When the country began, you know, we were breaking away from Great Britain. We were starting with a clean slate. I mean, there was nothing. Now there is something, and quite a something, you know, that needs to be to be abandoned. But I, I'm not quite sure if it's abandoned. You're talking about people resigning. I mean, who's going to yep. do that? Who's <laughs> who's going to give up that lifestyle? The people who are elected to anything, whether it's city council right on up to the presidency of the United States, and all they care about is being elected, and all they care about once they are elected is, is staying in office. And it dominates their life. And the reason it dominates their life is because there are unbelievable perks to be had forever. So how is anybody going to give that up? Well, there are many models to do this. Uh, But the main model is a large citizen group that not only goes across ordinary folks like you and me, but into the moneyed interests that support this goal, legal expertise, you know, top-rate lawyers, uh, business enterprises, media outlets, religious groups that have formed together into a a, a large conglomerate. You might call them the new 13 colonies. They're united and they persist. And what they do is a number of things from lawsuits to blockading offices to blockading entire government agencies to funding various enterprises. This kind of force and this kind of pressure over time can absolutely whittle down the system and whittle it down and burn it down and burn it down. And if it's 10 million of us, is that enough? Well, wait a minute. Isn't, isn't that what the Occupy movement is, is trying to achieve right now? And as it's more and more in the news, the authorities are clamping down more and more, right? Isn't that what's happening? The Occupy movement's like the tip of an iceberg. But underneath the water is, you know, 95 percent of the volume of the discontent and the volume of the powerful organizing. So, for example, what's been happening in the last week is a new sort of super organization called UnitedRepublic.org has come together. And what that's doing, it not only pulls in the goals of Occupy, but it pulls in a large amount of financing, the best legal minds on this subject in, in the country, business leaders, former disgruntled and and dismayed politicians who've tried to make changes, even former lobbyists, people who know the system, military people, people who really know the system, they're of the system. They're uniting now. And so in some sense, you think of the catapult of Occupy through the first volley, but there's a whole machine that is able to throw another and another and another. And I think UnitedRepublic.org is one of those uh, emergent phenomena that uses the net. It involves the Tea Party. It involves people on the left, the right, the middle. Uh, It's extremely inclusive, but it has staying power and force where it's going to count, which is at the institutional level. Well, I like the sound of that. Now, wait a minute. Bulletin, this just in. Paul in Carmel Valley has called. And we haven't even invited phone callers yet. But that's good. He's breaking the ice. Nikki tells me that we have to do a commercial break. And Nikki's the boss around these parts. And so we're going to uh, do what the boss uh, says. And when we come back, we'll start taking our first phone calls. Having lived through the remaking of countries like Czechoslovakia, South Africa, and the ubiquitous spread of radical technologies like personal computing, the internet, and global commerce, I still can't see why, in 2014, we couldn't radically remake America. For further understanding of how a constitutional convention could actually come about, get yourself a copy of Lawrence Lessig's book, Republic Lost. Find my draft of the Radical Remake document at www.levityzone.org. Search for Radical Remake, Podcast 31. I would like to thank Alan and Son Lundell, Michael Zwirling, and of course Galen Brandt for their support and encouragement in my foray into the fray with this bold concept. One more special note. Jacob Amon and I first met through our mutual interest in Occupy and the Radical Remake, and our subsequent partnership brought you the Levity Zone at the end of 2012. 
And as usual, Jacob created our cover art for this episode. Join me and MZ in the next Levity Zone, where we take calls from concerned, irate, and hopeful citizens from across Santa Cruz County.